In this video, we'll look at something as important as face diagrams. It is called a TTT diagram. In addition, we'll also look at different phases present in steel, including perlite, bainite, martensite, and some other phases. Before going to the technical part of today's video, I want to draw attention to this website by Professor Helmut Foll. Most of the information I'm presenting here in this video are from this website. If you are interested in learning more about iron, steel, and swords, definitely check out this website. It is highly recommended. Let's do a very quick recap. Uh, you should be very familiar with this now. This is the iron carbon phase diagram. And also, we know that with different carbon compositions, you will get different final microstructures. For example, if the composition is hypoeutectic, basically meaning the composition lies on the left-hand side of the eutectic point, you get perlite and ferrite. If it's right at the eutectic point, you'll get perlite. And if it's hypereutectic to the right-hand side of the eutectic point, you get perlite and cementite. So, so far so good. However, we have to know that this is based on thermodynamics. Kinetics can also play a critical role on what you get in your final microstructure. Here comes the TTT diagrams. TTT stands for time, temperature, transformation. On the right shows a typical TTT diagram for steel, and you can see there are a number of curves present in the curve. On the x-axis, that's time, on the y-axis, that's temperature, what we are looking at is the transformation. The diagram can be divided into a few regions. In the first region here, this is austenite. Then perlite, perlite plus bainite, bainite. You also see M here. M stands for martensite. MS means martensite starting temperature. M50 means 50% martensite and 50% austenite. M90 means 90% martensite and 10% retained austenite. Let's look at a few examples how to use TTT diagram to help us determine the final constituent of the steel. In the first case, the red curve, it goes straight down into temperature and it hits the M50 line and it remains at this temperature. What this tells us is the final microstructure is 50% martensite and 50% retained austenite. In the second example, the green curve, there's also a decrease in temperature, but here it's still in the austenite regime and it remains austenite. And after that, the temperature drops sharply down. And in this case, the final microstructure is 100% martensite. In the third example, the blue curve, again, the temperature initially goes down and again, it's in the austenite regime. Then it remains here for a long time and hits the 50% line. What this 50% line tells us is now that's 50% bainite and 50% retained austenite. After that, after that, the temperature further drops sharply and the retained austenite will face transform into martensite. So we have 50% bainite and 50% martensite. In the last case, uh, that's the orange curve, and the temperature drops, it's still austenite, then let's hold it for a long time, then everything becomes perlite. Then after further cooling, everything still remains as perlite. Note, perlite is the final microstructure, there's no more austenite, so you get perlite as the final microstructure. Just by looking at the figure on the right, you can see a trend here. If the cooling rate is very high, the steel can easily turn into martensite. If the cooling rate is intermediate, then the microstructure is something we call bainite. You will see what bainite is very soon. At low cooling rate, the final microstructure is perlite, which is the phase we have in the phase diagram. Therefore, phase diagram can only capture the phases from slow cooling at equilibrium. Now, Let's look at each phase in details. Perlite should not be a stranger to you, and you have the last structure with the ferrite and uh, 
uh, cementite plates alternating in the microstructure. Note that not all perlites are the same. Uh, again, depends on the cooling rate. You can get coarse perlite when the cooling rate is low, and fine perlite if the cooling rate is high. If the cooling rate is low enough, in each austenite grain, you can have only one colony of those perlite. If the cooling rate is very high, then you can have multiple colonies of perlite in one prior austenite grain. Regardless, you're getting coarse perlite or fine perlite. The transformation mechanism is still diffusional. Next, let's look at bainite. For bainitic transformation, it has been viewed as somewhere between the diffusional and the displacive transformation. You get bainite when the cooling rate is fairly high, but not super super high. Comparing to the perlite formation, the bainite formation is similar but not quite different. Because the cooling happens very fast, carbon atoms do not have enough time to diffuse long distances. So locally, you have those carbon-riched austenite regions. In many cases, those carbon atoms can precipitate out to form cementite at the bainite grain boundaries. This microstructure is called upper bainite. If the cooling rate is a bit high, then a lot of cementite precipitates can form within the bainite grains, and these ones are called lower bainites. Top right shows an EBSD map of a bainite steel, or bainitic steel, and you can see these needle-like or plate-like microstructure. Then on the bottom is a TEM micrograph of a bainite microstructure. You can see how fine those plates or needles are. Another thing is, if you pay special attention, you see a lot of cementite precipitates within the, uh, the bainite plates. What this tells us is it's likely to be a lower bainite. Next, we'll look at martensite. You get martensite when you cool the steel down at a very high cooling rate. The atoms don't have enough time to diffuse, so the entire transformation is displacive. Also, it is referred as diffusionless transformation. In this example, you can see by simply rearranging the, uh, the unit cell without any diffusion, you can get from a FCC structure into a BCT structure. I think that's a typo here instead of FCT, it should be BCT, body centered tetragonal. And on the right shows a TEM micrograph of martensite plates. Again, you can see how fine the microstructure is. If we think about the cooling rate and mechanical properties, usually higher the cooling rate, higher the hardness and the strength of the material. So martensite is the hardest, followed by bainite, then followed by perlite. If you stumble upon the steel literature, you will realize there are more phases than austenite, perlite, bainite, and martensite. Here, I'll just give you two more examples of different phases. The first is spheroidite. Spheroidite is achieved by heating a perlite microstructure for a long time. As the name suggests, spheroidite contains many spherical particles. Um, if you imagine we have the uh, politic microstructure, you have the last structure. The elongated grains are energetically unfavored. This is because given uh, the same volume, we want to minimize the surface area as much as possible. And we know that spheres has the least amount of surface area at a given volume. So those cementite plates will turn into spheres to minimize surface energy. Just like when you blow a soap bubble, it forms a like a round spherical bubble instead of something uh, elongated as a plate. In the steel literature, you may also have heard about the Wimmenstetten ferrite. Then what is Wimmenstetten ferrite? For that, uh, you need a hypoeutectic composition that's on the left-hand side of the eutectic point. Those pro-eutectic ferrite at a fairly high cooling rate, they will grow across the entire prior-austenite grain, giving you those Wimmenstetten ferrite. In the final slide, I want to quickly discuss the, the steel making, which is an ancient art. The blacksmith usually uh, hot works the, uh, the steel and quench it in cold water. And one thing I learned from a documentary is quite interesting. 
When making the Japanese samurai swords, kantana, the blacksmith will only dip the blade the very edge of the sword in water to locally fast cool the blade. This encourages the blade of the sword turn into martensite, whereas the back remains either bayonite or ferrite. We also know that the unit volume of martensite is larger than bayonite and the perlite, and that gives you the natural bending of the sword and the beautiful curvature. This is how the ancient blacksmith utilizes the TTT diagram to engineer steel with strong and hard edge and tough sword body. In the next video, we'll change gears and steering away from steels. We will look at precipitation in alloys using aluminum as the model system.